Good morning, family. Ah, am I speaking to angry people? Okay, if you are happy to be here, can I humbly ask that please uh, be on your feet, those who can. Yes, as I take this time to greet all of you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. For those who don't know me, my name is Sean, and today I am not with my lovely wife, Deborah. Uh, I am simply here to welcome you in the house of the Lord, amen. If you are coming here for the very first time, this is Celebration Church. We believe in loving God and loving His people. So you are at the right place at the right time. And um, I, would, I would really ask you to go and uh, love on Pastor Liz. Let's pray for her. She has just lost her mom. So just, you know, to, to, to assure you that we love you so much. And, uh, you know, you, you are in the, you know, at the right place. And please go give her a hug and tell her that she didn't make a mistake, you know, for being here this morning. Because you guys, all of you are a family and you are going to really give her and show her the love. Amen. 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 So we love you, Pastor Liz, and may the Lord heal you and your family. Amen. Amen. So let us all, you know, soak ourselves, you know, in, in the presence of God. Amen. Can we all bow our heads as I pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we yet again come before your throne, O Lord God of grace. We thank you for you have seen your faithfulness in this first service. And Lord, we believe that we will see yet again, Lord of God, the greatness of your glory in this second service. Father, I pray for Pastor Lizzie. That, oh God, as she's going through what she's going through, oh God, as she has just lost her mom. Father, may you give her strength, Lord, oh God, and necessary wisdom to enjoy this moment. Holy Spirit, I speak your comfort, Lord, oh God, in your heart and in your family. Father, may you heal, Lord, oh God, your broken heart. As your word says that, Lord, you are close, Lord, oh God, to those who are heartbroken. And Father, I know that you are even closer to her than any, Lord, oh God, uh, uh, than, than before. Father, I pray. Lord, oh God, for the vessel that we have anointed this morning to deliver your word. Father, I pray eloquence. I speak wisdom. I speak confidence upon her in the name that is above all names. Lord, I pray that may your word, oh God, be, Lord, oh God, a lamp upon the feet of your children who are here this morning. May your word be the light, Lord, oh God, upon their path in the name that is above all names. The name of Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming this morning. Can you give high five to someone next to you and say happy Sunday. Happy Sunday with a great smile. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are marching into our battle this morning, no doubt, in our minds that God is our victory. Hallelujah. Come on, let's march into our battle. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Son of man, I throw off this armor and raise up my 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is an awesome God this morning. He reigns. Hallelujah. Come on, let's clap. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with we. Stop power.
Hallelujah to you, Jesus, this morning. We give you the praise, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are here, Lord, to heal every heart, oh God. A broken heart, Lord Jesus Christ, you are here to heal, oh God.
you just for giving us hope. Thank you that we can look up to you in times when we are not feeling strong. Thank you, Jesus, just for all the grace and all the love. Amen. Good morning, celebration, and welcome. Thank you so much. You are welcome to sit down. Thank you for choosing Celebration Church as your place of worship today. We welcome you. If this is your first time, you're welcome to go to the next steps table to find out more. And um, yes, welcome and enjoy the service with us. Um, I just want to ask everybody a special hug for Lizzie and for Pastor Jacques in his absence. Lizzie lost her mom this weekend. And if you have a mom, you know the important role of a mom. So Lizzie, we're thinking of you and your family. We love you. And in this time of sadness, we rejoice with you that your mom is with Jesus. Thank you. So Pastor Jacques is still in Brazil, and he will be coming back later this week. So we're excited to have him back. But he sent a special message for all of you. Hey, friends. I'm standing here in Aracaju in Brazil. Um, what a wonderful place. Really enjoyed getting to know the people here. Uh, God's moving. We're building a bridge between Brazil and South Africa so that our young people would be able to really impact the world as God's impacting them when they experience different cultures, seeing what God's going to do. On uh, Saturday, we have our business men and women's breakfast, and I want to encourage you to invite somebody. Uh, this Saturday, we're going to be focusing on uh, what this next generation looks like and what does business look like when we try and reach the next generation so we're going to be looking at the generational differences do a little bit of a teaching around that and then we're going to be praying and sharing with our business people as we start looking at love mokapani and how we're going to change our town so if you are going to be around please come and join us uh, also invite somebody why don't we pay for somebody's breakfast and make sure we get the right people in the room to really change the world thank you we'll see you soon we look forward to having him back. He's not experiencing any cold like we are, right? <laughs> so this week, the past week, we started with life groups. If you have not joined a life group, it's not too late. You still have some time to sign up. So please go to the next steps table at the back and they can tell you of all the life groups that is available to join. And then like Pastor Jacques said, on Saturday, we'll have the business men and women's breakfast. It's only 160 Rand. You'll get a full breakfast for that, and it's at Butter Bistro at 8 o'clock. So please join us, bring a friend, bring two friends. And then, as he mentioned, that we're going to be talking about Love Mokupani. I know last week I told you guys about the care bags that we are putting together. Next week, we will have a bin with Love Mokupani's logo. Please bring some toothbrushes, toothpaste, soap. We will post a little ad on the group this week to tell you what items we need. And if you want to become part of Love Mokopani, please come see me in the cafe. Um, then next week, Sunday, we have Baptism Sunday. So if you feel that you need to be baptized and you are in obedience to God's word, please come and see Pastor Samuel. It's always a celebration when we can celebrate new life. It really is from death to life when we baptize people. So please um, join us with our families as we celebrate. And then if you brought your offering today, thank you so much for just giving and for your giving hearts. We have the boxes at the back. You can use SnapScan, you can use EFT, whatever is the easiest for you. But we thank you for just giving every week and every month. We appreciate you. And then I am honored to welcome Tabohu without Sean. Tabuchu will be um, sharing the message with us today, and she is such a powerful woman. Whenever she speaks, I can just smile. Tabuchu, thank you so much. We are looking forward to your message, and we love you, and thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. They said without Sean, some of the things you need to do them alone. Because when God calls you, sometimes he doesn't call you as a group. As much as is my husband, always there for me. But there are moments where I need to do it alone. Because my relationship with God is between me and him. 
So that is an encouragement to someone who's not married to say you can still do it alone. Because if God is calling you alone, you need to come alone and do it. Amen. Amen. Greetings in the name of Jesus. Are we happy to be here? I'm not sure about myself. I told them in the first service that I'm having constipation and diarrhea at the same time. Because standing in front of people can never be easy. But we do it anyway. Even with your beautiful faces looking at me, I'll do it anyway. Because we do what God has called us. For those who don't know me, my name is Taboho. My husband was here to do the welcome. And really, I'm God and really has, has blessed me with a man of your caliber. A man who's able to pray for me and call me to order. It's never easy to see me being disorderly, but he's the one who knows me when I'm out of order. And the manner in which he brings me back, it's always wonderful. Thank you for always praying for me. Thank you for fighting for me. When I'm with him, I'm not scared of anyone. When I'm with my husband, he can literally fight for me. He fights for me, he prays for me, and I'm honored. And just also to say to all the husbands who are here, we truly appreciate your leadership, JC. Your wives, I believe they are blessed to have leaders of your kind, Jewel. It, it helps us, and we believe that as wives, we are also a very, very big blessing to you. I believe that. I'm speaking for the woman. So really honored to be under your leadership and also for, for leading me so well. And also to our pastors who are leading us very well. Pastor Liz and Pastor Jack in his absence for believing in us. From the moment Sean and I met you a few years ago, you have always given us an opportunity to refine what we believe God has called us for. And for your leadership, I said in the first service, if there is a man and a woman of God whom I know who is so genuine, is these two people. I believe that you can attest that Pastor Jack, when he's here, he would always say some of the things that he thinks he did not do them so well. He doesn't hide to say, I'm the head, I'm the pastor. I cannot tell them that I do get angry sometimes on the road. I do. But he say it to us so that we might be encouraged to know that even if we falter, even if we stumble, but we still, go, we still, we still stand up and do what God has called us to do. Sometimes it looks like a joke when he says him and Pastor Liz, they fight. But when me and Sean fight, it, it doesn't condemn me to say it means I'm not as holy. It gives me courage that even those that I'm following in their footsteps, they go through this, but they still love each other. They still respect each other. So sometimes it looks like a joke. Yes, we do laugh. But the genuinity in the body of Christ is what we need in the times that we're living in. Sometimes the standard that we look at the men and the women of God, it is too high that we don't even aspire to attain to it because it's so high. But for you, high as it is, you make it look as if it's not that high. So it, it gives us courage to say we too can do it. So please tell Pastor Jack that thank you for, for your leadership. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for studying the word for our sake. Thank you for leading us so well. And also to our worship team, thank you for always being here and serving the body of Christ. What you do, I cannot do, and we appreciate that. And for everyone who's here this morning, may the Lord continue to bless you. When you go Sunday morning and say, I'm going to church, you don't know how, to how many people you're preaching to. You are giving somebody courage that it means this God. If this man of this caliber is following this Jesus, it means there's surely something good in this Jesus. So sometimes it's not about the words we say, but it's about the life we lead. Just by you waking up on a Sunday morning and say, I'm going to church, you're giving somebody courage. Many may not tell you, but you are a letter written by Christ that people read. So I just want to honor you this morning for being here 
and for just coming and worshiping and praising God. It's never easy, like I said, standing in front of you guys and sharing God's heart. But I believe the Lord will help me. Amen. I put a disclaimer in the first service that English is not even my third language, guys. Not even my fourth. It's somewhere there. So if any other language that it feels like Venek or a native language comes up, just know. English is not a first language. Amen. And the Lord will help us. Let us pray. The Spirit of the living God, thank you for this moment. I know that you want to speak to your people. I pray that I will not stand in your way of delivering your heart to your very own people. Any form of destruction, right now we bring it down in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please speak to your people. And I had a sense that God wants to speak to his people. Thus, when I pray this morning, I said to God, may I not be a distraction or a hindrance for you to inhibit you from speaking to your own people. May I be a vessel that is able to deliver his heart to his people. Paul says, pray that I may, give, I may be given the utterance to deliver God's word. Because when we speak God's word, we speak God's word. It's God's word. That's it. So I believe that this week, that's it. Morning, I'll be delivering God's heart to his people. I normally say, God, I do not know what your people are going through. Thus, it's never easy to speak to the people that you struggles, their wins, their victories. But when we gather in such a space, we believe God who is able to give us the wisdom and the spirit of discernment that whatever that we shall utter, we really pray that it be that which God wants you to hear. May God make it easy for you this morning to hear what he's saying to you. Because I believe God's word at all times, it is a command, it is an instruction, not a suggestion. I always tell people that when God says rise up, it's an instruction. He's not asking to you feel like getting healed. When he says be healed, you get healed. Because I believe that his word is powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Able to discern our minds and our thoughts. This morning the title of my message is our advocate. For those who studied law for those who are lawyers. Do we have any legal practitioners in the house? I know in the first service I had an advocate sitting here. For those who love watching services like Sud, you can just raise your hand. For those who love, okay, this one is not very holy, but how to get away with murder. <laughs> I know there's somebody who watched it. So there are so many services about law. Um, has there been anyone who has ever been to court in this place? I've been to court a couple of times, not because I had a, a traffic fine, but I was there at times to help people and just to be of support to somebody who was going through a hard time. So when you look at the courts, there is an advocate. In most cases, we don't get to know an advocate because we are exposed to attorneys. An advocate is somebody whom an attorney goes to and gives them a brief about the client. Not the client itself approaches the advocate. So it is the advocate who will then go and advocate for you, speaks on your behalf. So today, I wanted to, to title my message Condemnation because that's a word that God gave me at, at, um, when I heard that I must come and deliver God's word. But then God also gave me from, I need to speak about condemnation. I need to speak about what the enemy is doing to us. But I need to speak it from a place of victory. That's why I'm saying our advocate. We are in battle. We are constantly in the courts. But we have an advocate. Who is advocating for us? So hence my message We'll start from our advocate to say that regardless of what happens, we must know that we have an advocate. In the book of Job 1, that will be the basis of our scripture this morning. 
the book of Job 1 verse 6 to 7. I love it in the NLT translation. It says, one day the members of the heavenly court, they came to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that is going on. Let me just put a disclaimer in my examples. I hear that I'm being accused for an example that I used. The enemy comes into the heavenly courts. That's what the Bible say. I, I, I was saying in the first service, I think God, I think the Bible, whoever was writing certain portions, they really have the love for the legal profession. If you are still doubting if you need to go into legal studies, I'll encourage you to go there. Because it does speak about the legal system as well. The Bible says there would, there, there would be the heavenly beings, the heavenly the members of the heavenly court who will go into the court and there would be a judge who is our God and there will be Satan who is the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says God asked him, Satan, where have you been? I know that Satan is the father of lies, but this time I think he spoke the truth. He said, I've been patrolling. In the first service, I say Uncle Bunny patrols outside and he's able to detect, he, he, he detected that my car, what do you call it? The nuts, one of the nuts was out and he did tell me. So they say, I said he stole my nuts, guys. Please help me. So he patrols outside. He looks at what is happening and he's able at times to report to you that I saw that you left your car lights on. So in this instance, this is the enemy whom in the message translation, the Bible says he is a designated accuser who goes before God and he says, I've been patrolling and I've been seeing, I've been patrolling everything that is happening. And he is there to bring the report. The enemy, he knows his job. He knows the contract that he has that he must accuse you. Therefore, he does his job every day. He says, I was patrolling. I was patrolling the earth, and he was there to give the report of what he observed. The Bible says, God says, did you see my servant Job? And he says, yes, I did. And there is no way that he will not fear you. Because you have, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have sort of protected him. There is no way. At this instance, the devil is telling the truth to say, I have seen him. Yes, I know that he loves you. He fears you. But there is a but because you protected him. He gave a report of what he saw. The Bible says Job was righteous. And the devil did not say, no, he's not righteous. What I'm saying is that some of the report that the enemy has about you, they are the things that we have done. If I don't speak well to my husband, the enemy is, is, is noting. If I'm on the road and I'm busy saying the words that I should not say that we sometimes say because of the flesh, the enemy is writing. At work, I got late, the enemy is writing. As I go before God and say, Lord, I need a promotion, the enemy comes. Not Shakir. This one comes to work late. He is your accuser. He is doing what he has to do. Not to say that any accusation that the enemy brings against, say that any accusations to, it is the things that you did not do. Some you have done them. He patrols in the hospital wards. I'm there. Maybe I had an abortion. Not for medical reasons. Maybe I'm cheating on my husband. He is there. Maybe I'm busy speaking lies. These are the things I've done. This is the report that he's going to bring. He says, I am looking at everything. In the book of Revelations, it says, day and night, he goes before. If he can go before God day and night and bring the report, it says, even at night, he captures what we are doing. Don't lose heart. I'm not here to condemn you. 
but I'm just here to tell you that some of the report that the enemy brings about us, they are true. You know that one person that you hate. You can't stand that person. The enemy is noting because it is his job to accuse you. He brings it before God. And that's when we say the devil will condemn you. But we have the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, who convicts us of our sins. And when we raise our hand and say, Jesus, I'm sorry, it's canceled. But yet the enemy does not take your sorry. He will still bring it before God and say, but you can't use him. He just did this and this and this. You can't use him. He is not worthy. He did not sleep at home, this one. You can't. This one stole. This one, you can't use him. That's what the enemy does. But thank God, in the book of John 14, verse 6, the Bible says, And I ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, a comforter, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener, a standby, to be with you forever. Even though the accuser daily accuses you, Luciano, and say this one makes fun of the boy every day, even though he might accuse you, but you have the advocate, the helper. Remember, like I said, the Bible says in the heavenly courts, as much as we might not be aware that daily we are approaching the courts, but the Bible says we need to approach the throne of God boldly with no fear. Every day as we present ourselves before God, our petitions before God, we also have the enemy who's accusing us. But Jesus says, I will give you another helper because Jesus was our helper. When we give our lives to Jesus, we, we receive a helper, somebody who helps us. And now because Jesus was living, he says to his disciples, I'm going to give you another helper, Paracletos. For those who know Greek, it says Paraclete means a family attorney. From the onset, God has sorted this one out. And he says in, 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 in the Amplified Translation, it says he is your advocate. He is the one when you go into the courts. The Holy Spirit will present himself as an advocate who speaks on your behalf. They say an advocate, it, he has a special skill. If you look at the medical profession, we have the general practitioners and we have the specialists. In the legal field, we have an attorney and we have an advocate who has a special skill to argue your case in the presence of the Lord. When the enemy pulls you down because of the things that he accuses you of, you have an advocate, somebody who is speaking on your behalf. In the days in which we are living in, you will pay for the services of, of an advocate. But because here we're talking about the spiritual realm, I, I, I hope, I don't want to lose any of us. We are speaking about the spiritual realms, things that happen outside of this. We are not paying for an advocate. If you look at the law of South Africa, it says every, every citizen has a right to a legal presentation. Because it's very important that some cases you cannot argue them for yourself. You need the Holy Spirit who would come and advocate for you. As he convicts you, you repent. He stand by you. In the Amplified Translation, it says he is your standby. He is your strengthener. He is your helper. He is your counselor. So I want you to, to really be encouraged to know that when you are in Christ, you have a helper, somebody who's helping you. Hallelujah. I forgot to put a disclaimer that I am black. When we preach, guys, we even shout. We even want you to say hallelujah and amen. I love this church because we are able to embrace the different ethnic groups. So I don't mind you saying hallelujah and amen and shouting. I'm very much black. I think if there is a race that understood the mandate when it says enter into his courts with praise and shout out to God, it is our race. And we can shout. Danny, we can, we can dance, we can shout. So don't be scared when I shout. 
is still in me. It's in me. Amen. Amen. So we have an advocate, the one who argues your case. There are so many things that the enemy brings. Somebody would ask, why is the enemy accusing me? Why is the enemy fighting so hard day and night to accuse me? I know I might be... Okay. I think the, 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 the tech team is with me. Why is the enemy accusing us? Why is he given this role to accuse you as daily? So that we may not do what God has called you to do. The enemy accuses you so that he will derail you from what God has called you to do. The enemy will accuse you. He will bring that report so that he can, he can hold you into prison. Keep you hostage to your past. We all have a past. And some of our past, we cannot actually talk about them. In the, in, in the presence of people, of the things we did, of the things we say, of the things we did not do. Those are the reports that the enemy brings before God against us. The enemy wants to keep us in cages, to say everybody can serve God, everybody can minister, but not you. You have done this and that. You have spoken bad. You have raped someone. You have broken somebody's marriage. You have stolen something. Anyone and everyone can serve God, but not you. You are not worthy to minister before God. And the enemy will make sure that he devalues even the little value that you think you have. I struggled a lot with condemnation. I would do one mistake and everything will just crumble. And I was telling them in the first service, sometimes we even make mistakes here. And when they say, come next week, I feel like, ah, I can't. Even with the worship team, I was just saying that thank you for, for their leadership. Some days the, the, the lyrics get mixed up. And the enemy will condemn you and say, you, you cannot even follow a simple things of following the lyrics. You cannot even do a simple task at least of just welcoming people. You're not worthy. And those are the things that the enemy says to us. You know when that video plays and you see all your mistakes and all your wrongs, JC, the things you said to Lindy that were not nice, and the enemy is playing them to say you can, you, everyone can serve God but not you, you're not worthy. And that is a report that the enemy has against us. And he's using it as a weapon to keep you bondaged. He brings the accusation and disapproval about you before God. And I believe that Paul, the writer of Romans, in Romans 8 verse 1, he says there is now, therefore, no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul, he was Saul. He accused a lot of Christians, a lot of believers, killed so many discouraged them but yet God called him to minister about the very same Jesus that he spoke better about and I understand maybe that's why Paul was able to write Romans 8 verse 1 to say now therefore there is no condemnation against you for you and Christ Jesus I believe he was also speaking to himself that even though I did so many wrong things there is no condemnation the case is closed against me when you look at the life of Moses, Moses killed someone. He killed an Egyptian. Yes, later God sends him to Egypt to say, go release my people. Do you think it was an easy task for Moses? The other day he tried when, 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 when people of his tribe were fighting together, when the, Israelites were, the two Israelites were fighting. And the other one said, do you want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Do you want to kill me? And now God is sending him to them and say, go and release them. Go and speak to the Egyptian. That should have been a report enough for Moses not to go to Egypt and say, but I have done this and this. When you look at 
the life of the, 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 the lineage of Jesus. When you look at Matthew 1, it says it has some interesting characters there. It has Judah. For those who know Judah slept with Tamar, Tamar was the daughter-in-law because she pretended she was a prostitute. If you look there, we have Bathsheba as well, who was somebody's wife who slept with, somebody's, with, with, with David. When you look at that line of Jesus, we have Rahab, who was a prostitute. These are the people that Matthew saw it fit to mention. To say, irregardless of the lives that they have lived, irregardless of the people that they were, yet they are worthy to be counted in the line of Jesus. Yet you are worthy as you are here to be counted as a minister for the gospel. You are worthy as you're sitting here. Hence, Matthew saw it fit to bring it to our remembrance and our understanding. To say, even though they had such a colorful past, but they were still worthy to be found in the line of Jesus. I said that the enemy uses different weapons to hold us back. To pull us back so that we may not be able to do what God has called us to do. I think that is his biggest mission. To change the whole setup that God has. He did it in the beginning in the book of Genesis, if you can check. God had a, had a different and a beautiful picture. That this is man, this is how he's going to live. But the enemy disrupted it there. And he is still disrupting it even today. To change the narrative, to change the, the, the plan of God about our lives. But it will not change. Because we have an advocate who is on our side. The book of 2 Corinthians 10 was also written. Corinthians is a, it, it, it's a letter that was written by Paul to the Corinthians. He says, for, for the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. What is a stronghold? There are different strongholds. There the, are the, the, the different holds that are so strong that the enemy has against us. The reports that he has about us, those are the strongholds, and he is keeping us there. And now Paul writes to the Corinthians and say, for the weapons of your warfare, they are not carnal, they are not physical, they are mighty to the pulling down of the strongholds that the enemy has on us. The weapons that we have, they are not carnal. So are the weapons that the enemy uses against you. They are not carnal. When we talk about spiritual warfare, you know that we don't talk about fighting blood with blood. We don't talk about the, the Vikings. But this is a spiritual realm where we speak about our weapons not being carnal. The enemy uses so many weapons against us. One of them is time. To the young people, we think we have time. I will serve God in a few years when the conditions allow me, when I get married, when I have money. We think we have time. And the enemy made sure that he gave us that deception to say you have time, you can still serve God some other time. And for the older ones, I see my lovely Danis here. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the old ones who are here, the old people here. We feel I'm too old to be God. I'm too old to be used by God in this generation. My time is over. I, I, what is it that I can give to this generation? There is so much more that we can still get from you. There is still some, there's still much more that we can learn from you. Even in your beautiful, older, gray age, there's still something. So the enemy has also made it as a weapon to say you are too old. This generation, they don't even hear you. They don't even understand you. But let me tell you, the fact that you're still alive, the fact that you're still here, the Bible says a dead lion 
is better than a living dog. I'll put a disclaimer, it's, it's not me, it's the Bible. I'm not saying anybody's a, you get what I'm saying. But the fact that you are still alive, they can still impact me in my younger age. You young people, let me remind you, if you are 30 and you're going to die at 32, you're old. And if you are 50 and you're going to die at 101, you're pretty much young. Sometimes we have this misconception that because I'm still young, I still have time. Serve God now while time still allows. In Psalm 90 verse 12, it says, help us to remember that our, our days are numbered. It says, help us to interpret our lives correctly. If we can learn to interpret our lives correctly, if we can learn that our days are numbered, young and strong as I am, my days are numbered. It says to me the time to serve God is when? It's now. So even to those who are a bit older, you are still relevant for this generation. Another weapon that the enemy uses is fear. Ah, you know fear. I went for my driver's test a few years ago. Hey, and I did not want to pray bribe. Long story short, I think I failed three times. Because I'm like, I'm not going to pay. But I paid because I, get my, I got my license a bit late. I was doing, I think, the side parking. Ooh. And the clash and my feet. It was pumping, it was shaking. They said to me, when the car engages, you pull your handbrake. I can't even hear the sound. It's too busy. I'm shaking, I'm fearful of failing. But because I wanted to get the driver's license, I had to press on. I was telling them that last week we went to Hraskop. I don't know who has been to the big swing. You've been to the big swing. What do they call that thing where we jump in? Is it a bunchy jumping? Yeah. The peer pressure got me. Rose will remember. And I said, no, I'm going. I'm also jumping. They're like, it's 650. I'm like, yeah, I'm jumping. It's raining. I'm jumping. Yeah, you should have seen me. I didn't want to bring the video. When they say I must put my feet on the edge, I think it's 90 meters down. And they just tie me here. Peer press. And I hold on to that man like, I don't know. I didn't want to let him go. He says, I'm going to count one, two, three, I'm going to throw you in. Ah, I don't remember two. Those who were there, they heard me screaming. By the time I was getting there, I was thinking, maybe I should change. Because I was so fearful. They couldn't see me, but I couldn't walk properly. Because now the reality of saying, I might die. I'm a mother. I have two children. Hey, my husband is going to be without a wife. So many things. I was fearful and I was shaking. But I had to, for the videos and the cameras, I had to like, and I jumped. I was screaming. I was shaking when I was going there. But I had to do it. So what I'm saying is that even in your fear, what God has called you, shaking as you might be shaking, fearful as you might be, go do it. You don't know the freedom that I got on the other side. I cannot explain it. I felt I'm on top of the world. Bring any bunch jumping in the world. There's a devil's pool in Zambia. I was like, I'm ready for it. That time for me, water is only for drinking, not swimming. That time I feel I can do this because I was able to conquer something that I'm more fearful of. And I'm saying some of you, you're so fearful to stand in front of people to minister God's word. Let me tell you, I'm also fearful. 
Like I said, I said I was constipated and having diarrhea at the same time this morning. Because I was fearful. I know I need not to be fearful. I don't have to fear. But fear can get so real that you shake and you can't even hear your thoughts the way you're so scared. And some of you, God has called you in your workspaces to be the leaders that God has called you to be. And you're busy pulling back because fear is holding you. Of course you might fail. When I was jumping there, of course I can die. That is given. I can be embarrassed and say, imagine a live video and then somebody dies. Like, it's not even the embarrassment, it's something else. And when I did that, I, I made sure that I go to the bathroom first because anything can happen. So what I'm saying is that even in your fear, what God has called you to do, it's far bigger than your fear. I said if Pastor Liz and Pastor Jack did not go to Zambia when God was calling you and go and help those girls out calling you and go outside to come out of the, the marriages as, as young children in Zambia, they get married, Lurika, the girls of your age, they get married to older men. If they did not heed God's voice and go, I believe it might have been fearful. You're going into a country that is not yours. They speak a language that is not yours. But God called them to say, go. And some of you, God is calling you to people that might not even understand your language. But God is saying, go. Some of you, you're working in a male-dominated environment where God says, lead them. Even in your fear. If you don't know, if you don't do what God has called you to do, sorry, Luciano, I know that when I have you, still go in your fear. Fearful as it might be, it will never be easy. I know most of you might be fearful of speaking here. I'm just like you. But when the anointing and the call of God is upon your life, it says his anointing has the ability to break. You are all gifted. The Bible, when it speaks about the gift of the spirit, it gives a picture of a body. I was saying the first session, imagine if your mouth, JC. I'm sorry, but imagine if your mouth decides that today I'm not going to open. I'm not going to chew anything. And your time is like, I want to eat. And your hand is like, I don't know if I, I can touch it. Yes, I have it, but... And that is sometimes what we do in the body of Christ. You withholding your gift. You not allowing God to use you. I said the giftings, let's not look at only the fivefold ministries. Not every one of us is called to preach. Not everyone is called to be a prophet and all those gifts. But some of you, you're called to bring researches that are groundbreaking in the area where God has called you. In your careers as a travel agent, God might have called you to bring up different, I don't know, travel areas and give us an exposure to the tourism in an eye that you have never seen it. Some of you are accountants. You can balance the book like nobody's business. God's anointing is not only limited to these four walls. You can be an attorney. A politician like our politician in the house here. Yeah. Who, when you, when you speak to people, I can say the same thing, but people will not hear me like they heard you. You can solve a different math equation like nobody's business. God has anointed us differently in different spaces. Don't limit yourself and say, but I'm not called to preach. I'm not called to... You are called even as a medical practitioner. The manner in which you speak to us when we come to hospital, we can sense even the anointing over you. Even in the counseling room as a psychologist, the anointing of the Lord that is upon you, it makes it easy even to tell you what we ate yesterday because we felt so free in your presence because of the anointing that is upon your life. But imagine if you don't want to do what God has called you to do and say, I am old, I'm young, and I'm fearful. Another weapon that the Lord showed me, it sounds so funny when I say the Lord showed me, but one of the weapons that I had a sense the Lord wanted me to speak about is about gender. I'm a woman. I cannot lead in my workspace. 
I'm a woman. I cannot be a scientist. I'm a woman. I cannot preach. And I was saying that in the era that we're living in, we are in the, in the generation of empowering women, which is all good. But in, the, in, 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 in that space, we are also disempowering you as men. We empower a woman to a point that when I look at a man, I'm like, I can do what you can do. But some of the things, honestly, we cannot. And the enemy has found a way to say, okay, now women are getting powered. Let me disempower this man. Let me show him that he doesn't have that value that he thinks he has as a man. Even women can do what you do. There's nothing special about you. That's what the enemy says. We are in a generation where men are being disempowered under our watch. And men, at times, they don't realize that the enemy is trying to pull you down and say, but you cannot. You're not men enough. You never had a dad. How can you lead a family? That's a weapon that the enemy is using against you to pull you back. To say all men can do it but you. So the Bible says in the book of John, 1 John 3, verse 20, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. If you're sitting here and your heart is condemning you and making you feel guilty, God is greater than our hearts. We have a helper and advocate who convicts us of our wrong and who gives us the ability to be able to stand and do what God has called you to do. In the book of Isaiah 54, I know we know the scripture very well. The Bible says, there is no weapon that is formed against you that will ever prevail. And it says, this is our heritage as the sons and the daughters of God. That every voice that rises itself up against you to accuse you, you can be able to silence it. I said that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. And I think that's why Isaiah saw it fit to remind you that there are weapons that are formed against you. If you did not know, you just thought it's me not wanting to do what God has called me. Just know there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a third hand, an upper hand. You just said, ah, no, it's just me when, when I'm ready. And the enemy is smiling because he knows that you might not have that time and opportunity. Isaiah says, the weapons that are formed against you, they will not prevail. You can silence any voice that condemns you and accuses you before God. The voice that says, not you, you can silence it by speaking God's word over it. That's why it's very important for us to get acquainted with the word of God. This is your benefit as a son and as a daughter that you can refute any word that the enemy speaks against you. Some of you, the enemy told you that you are so poor you cannot even minister. You are so poor you can't even. You are so dark you can't even. You, you, you have done so many bad things you can't even. But I'm here to remind you that weapons have been formed against you. But none of them will prevail against you. And this is a promise in God's word. One of the prophets says, God watches over his word. He is quick to perform it. The song that we sang, the one we started with, it says he's a promise keeper. It's a promise that he gave me that no weapon that is formed against me will prosper. But it takes me to realize that there is a weapon that is formed against me. For me to be able to stand up and say, fearful as I am, female as I am, I'm going to do what God has called me. In the book of 2 Timothy 1.6, it says, That is why I remind you to fan into flame the gracious gift of God, that inner fire, that special endowment, which is in you through the laying on of my hand with those of the elders at your ordination. There is something that the Lord has gifted you with. Flame it into flames. 
Flame it into flames. Invest in that which God has given you. That business idea that God has given you. That ministry that God wants you to, to, to start. Flame it into flames. Make it come alive. Invest in it. Pray over it. And go do what God has called you to do. I'm nearing the end. But above all things, I wanted to remind all of us here that there is something that God has called you to do. There is something that God has put over your life. And unfortunately, he expects us to do something about it. I don't know what it is, but what I can tell you is that the time is now. Your failure of not doing what God has called you to do might have a replications and implications to generations and not just one. I just want to scare you if I can. To say there are so many generations that are waiting for you to do what God has called you to do. For them to be liberated. If there was anything that says a woman cannot preach, I'm trying to preach to say even to the younger generations to know that it is possible. But if I sit down, they might think it's not possible. William, if we cannot have politicians who fear God and you don't go there and show that, we might, think we might not even be interested to go in. There are so many things, so many. Sometimes we look at ourselves and say, I'm young. But there are generations. Whenever I think of the Zambian girls, I'm just thinking of how many generations are being rescued. You might be rescuing one, one person. When you rescue me, when you rescue Sean, the, the generations that are attached to him, they are getting freedom as well. They'll be able to say, but my grandfather... That's why I'm saying, go do what God has called you to do. It will benefit you when, 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 when we look at a tree, it has fruits. It benefits other people more than it benefits the tree. The tree does benefit because it does what it does. It bears fruit, it looks good. But it benefits those who are to get fruits from it. We want to benefit from your gift. The generations and generations want to benefit from your gift. And here you are still sitting being fearful. Even in our fear we go. In the book of Acts 1.8, it says I will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes over you. In the book of Timothy, it says, I have not given you the spirit of fear. I've given you the spirit of power, of a sound mind, and of love. So you have the heavens backing you when you go out there and do what God has called you to do. It says, in the last generation, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the end times, I'll pour out my spirit upon every flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Because everybody, regardless of your age, when that spirit has been poured, you have something to do. So I'm saying, go fan that gift that God has given you into flames. In the book of Revelation, as I close, here it says, we defeat the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the words of our mouth, the testimony of our lives. In the book of Revelation, it says, day and night, let me just read it, then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser, the one who accuses us, he accuses us day and night. But you can defeat him by the blood of the lamb and the power of your testimony. So I'm saying that as an invitation as well, that if you have not yet given your life over to Jesus, I will recommend Jesus this morning. Because he says, then I will give you another helper. It means there had to be Jesus as the first helper. 